Okay, I think this is probably going to be our last bit of lecture for this chapter. Um, so I was speaking just before we stopped about examples of employment structures for special needs teens. So remember when we were talking about competitive employment being sort of like an equal pay, um, a job that anyone actually in, in the adult world could do, uh, I'm saying that in a qualified voice, but I hope you know what I mean by that. I was using the example of running the register at Taco Bell. An adult can do that without any special needs, and a special needs adult can do that with the right kind of training and if their barriers are not too high. Um, so there are four different models of what is called supported employment for special needs young people. Um, the first one is called the small business model, and this is where in a school setting they might um, have a, a little business set up, a little business enterprise set up. So in your textbook they give some examples of different um, kinds of things like this. If you remember in an earlier chapter there were special ed students who were making um, buckeye necklaces, and buckeyes are this kind of nut that come from a buckeye tree actually that grows not so much in the south but in other parts of the United States and they were a part of painting these cute little necklaces and stringing these beads and selling them you know at craft fairs or to other teachers or other students and so that's a really good example of a business enterprise that is set um, actually in the school itself and they can learn all kinds of employment um, behaviors or pre-employment behaviors by doing this, you can imagine if they're making these buckeye ne necklaces that they are, you know, producing them at a certain kind of regularity or speed, if you will, production level. Um, but they also need to make sure that their work has high quality and that it's not sloppy or messy. They need to um, make the buckeye necklace exactly how the sample is um, and not just make it in any way that they want to. Um, so, you know, the small business model is really a cool, uh, one of the cool ways to do supportive employment. And um, I think another one was that they, the students in a high school setting had an espresso bar where they sold um, certainly coffees, but then probably like muffins and bagels and things like that. So here's another one called the mobile work crew. And this is usually a single purpose kind of a business. So it might be um, a business that someone has where they water people's plants when they're out of town. And so this mobile work crew would have, you know, a handful of people associated with it, and they would have a job supervisor, and they would do this one very specific task. Um, it could be that they do building maintenance, um, or they might do uh, lawn care. So any kind of very specific task that um, a crew could uh, arrive at a job site and then do the work and then leave, but they always have someone there who's, um, you know, supporting their work and supervising their work, and they're getting paid a, an hourly wage to do that. So that's called mobile work crew. Then there's something called enclave empl supported employment, and this is an enclave is a small. Um, place, I think, or a, and, and so the reference to using this word enclave has to do with there would be um, at a work site an enclave or a special place or area of work that is being done by a group of students or young adults who are of this special needs community. So let me think of an example of this. Um, let's use the example of a um, um, maybe we'll use an example of a Starbucks. And so if, if there was a Starbucks franchise that was being run and in the back room of that Starbucks there were students of this special needs category and they all worked together and they were the ones who um, you know put together the cups that people's drinks come in. And so they would be in this regular business environment, but they would be sort of off in their own um, kind of work group doing this work. And, and also they would be probably supported by either a person a manager on the site or a co-worker maybe on the site or maybe an employment specialist. Um, and I'll talk about what an, or a job coach. I'll talk about that maybe at the end. Um, and then individual placement is, is where 
a student is just one person is placed in a business environment and works um, you know for a business and so this person would be carefully placed. I remember reading a, a while back or hearing on public radio maybe about a woman in North Carolina who had a daughter who had autism and she opened up a coffee shop it might have been in Wilmington and she hired her daughter to work in this coffee shop and so her daughter was embedded in a real business and it was just she and other workers at this site so that could be an example of that um, individual placement so in the best examples of individual placement the job is really carefully carved out and the duties um, that are assigned to the special needs student are duties that they can absolutely do um, and also that they've been very carefully trained to to do these particular duties um, and so this brings me to the place of just mentioning to you the idea of job coaches and being a job coach is something that's sort of an old idea um, often it's through the vocational rehab um, division of our um, employment organization in the state I'm not thinking of that exact organization but voc rehab um, being a job coach is one of those entry-level jobs that a human services person probably could get um, and so a job coach is the person who you know tries to prepare and supervise and goes in and checks on um, employees of this type just to see how they're doing and so for example my sister Susie working at um, the Taco Bell she very well might have had a job coach at the very beginning she's worked at Taco Bell now for nine years but um, you know she probably had a job coach that prepared her for what it was going to be like to work at Taco Bell they might have shown her how to use their particular um, um, cash register system they might have shown her how to you know clock in and clock out of her job they might have coached her on how what she was supposed to wear and all of that and then if something happened where for example Susie does this rocking behavior say and her her boss the manager of the Taco Bell calls up her job coach and says hey you know Susie's doing pretty well but she does have this behavior and it's starting to be something that you know the other teenagers who work here are making fun of her for and I feel bad for her and she you know can you help with this and so a job coach would might would come in and you know intercede in this kind of a situation so it's this job coach also does some problem solving I, is what I'm trying to get at with you here but so job coaches have a long history of being embedded in this sort of um, this part of the uh, employment lives of students who have special needs it's, it's a long history a very well established Kind of role if you will um, but now the thinking in vocational rehab and in teachers who are really um, innovative let's say and progressive in preparing um, special needs students what the thinking is now is that you know having a job coach come in is pretty disruptive actually because the student might act differently when the job coach shows up um, they might you know perform at a lower level or a higher level um, also it kind of disrupts the whole workflow because now there's this job coach in here while somebody's trying to run a register and wait on clients or customers um, and so there are lots of reasons that the presence of the job coach is you know creates kind of false behavior if you will or disruptive behavior so now that we have technology at, which I alluded to at, at the very beginning of this lecture um, some of the uh, trainings if you will that a job coach might do to solve a problem could probably be just handled by co-workers or by the manager and so um, part of this has to do with the student using technology and there's a great example in your textbook that I'll tell you about um, where a student you know might be listening to what looks like you know their phone listening to music and, and they might even be actually listening to songs that they like but embedded in those songs is a little break that says, okay, make sure you look around and that there's no trash on the ground. And then the song might continue to play in their earphones for another minute and a half. And then there'll be a break and there's a recorded voice saying, okay, you need to go outside the building and make sure that you're picking up trash outside the building too. So go ahead and do that now. 
And so you can see that this is sort of a prompting, um, a use of technology to prompt the client, to, the student to stay on task with their job, the employer, employee, I mean. Um, and so this is an important piece. The other piece that sort of takes the job coach out is working with the people who actually are other employees at this student's um, employment site and perhaps you know identifying someone who's just either really good at supervising other people or very kind or good and kind who would be willing to take on someone like my sister Susie kind of take her under the wing not be cruel to her but also have high expectations and also to solve problems as they come up and so maybe this employee would get paid you know 50 cents more an hour or a dollar more an hour or maybe they just would be assigned to do this as a part of their job but you know I think the point of this is that transition specialists are kind of falling away from being a job coach and coming in on a site and creating all this disruption and trying to find ways to um, coach the student to be a really good worker by using technology or using people who are already inside the business um, to pay attention to the quality of this person's work and help this person make corrections as are needed so that the ultimate thing can happen is that they get to keep their job um, and they become a good worker and so they become a valued member of the team and just think how that feels um, to students uh, like this. Let's see. Um, there's another, I think I, I'm not sure I mentioned what sheltered employment is to you, um, but for students who have really quite severe disabilities, um, being in some kind of dedicated space and then doing work tasks is uh, one of the areas that students can um, be placed in. This sheltered workshop model used to be widely, widely used um, in the 70s and in the 80s. Even when I first started working at Sandhills, I remember going to a sheltered workshop for some leadership thing I was involved with. And so these students, you know, got brought to this place. Um, and in this case, it was a little building, an old school building that was retired. And they came in, they were transported there. They um, had a room where they did work, um, and then they had a lunch room, and they had, uh, you know, then they would leave at the end of the day. It was kind of like a work site, um, but then they also got some classroom teaching. Well, and what these students did was, next time you go by a, a uh, telephone pole, notice that on telephone poles they all have these identifying, like, tin tags that are, that are um, nailed into the telephone pole. They're numbered. And I guess they probably identify the pole so that if there's a repair that needs to happen, they're easily found. And these students at this sheltered workshop, they made those. Um, they also did some other kind of what would be called piecework. So I remember seeing bins and bins and bins of these, um, you know, the kind of sponges that you take out of plastic that you buy at the grocery store and they have a scrubby side and a sponge side. They were involved with um, putting those into the plastic sleeves that they then, you know, somehow sealed and those sponges then got transported to be actually shipped out to grocery stores and so on. So a sheltered workshop is this kind of a place and it is for students who have really kind of the most severe impairments um, and it would be, I guess, if we're going to talk about it in this way, sort of the lowest level of placement for students with the least amount of independence and freedom. Um, but you know, perfect for students who are, have pretty severe impairments. They still want to be young adults and they still want to go out in the world. Um, there's just one last thing I might want to mention to you is to pay attention to the uh, text at the end where they describe different living situations that students can be in. So we've talked a lot about employment. That is the big focus of transition services. But remember, transition services in schools are also supposed to be about quality of life, so community involvement is a piece of that. And then they're, you know, under community involvement is sort of the whole category of residence, where these students would actually live. And so there are different living situations, of course, that students can be um, involved with. 
and some parents that I know who have special needs kids would very much prefer for them to be at home. They want them to be safe, they want them supervised at all times, they don't want them to be victimized in any way on a job site. This is, after all, um, part of what is reality. Uh, and so some students are not, uh, their parents don't want them to live away from home. But there are s many situations where these kinds of students, special needs students, would love to live in their own apartment and can live in their own apartment. And so the young man, Fossil, that I read, um, the obituary that I read to you today, he did transition into living into this kind of young adult living environment. Um, I know a couple of people actually in my sort of friendship circle who have had students like this and now we're all getting a little bit older and they are actually transitioning their kids um, to being in these these young adult living situations and I think part of that is probably because the student wants to do it and it's developmentally appropriate for them and it's exciting for them and so there's a lot of supervision in these um, in these living situations but the student gets to have this experience of you know having their own apartment having their own room choosing their own groceries um, being a part of cooking their own meals probably getting themselves to a job um, I'm thinking actually about my nephew who has autism to some degree and he either walks to his work or takes a bus to his work and he still lives at home and, and that's really what everybody wants for him he does not want to live in his own apartment or in a group setting he wants to be living with his mom um, but he does have this other kind of life that seems to be kind of enriched um, and so these living situations are are things that I want you to take a look at. I'm not going to lecture about them. Um, but just know that there are all kinds of creative solutions. So sometimes it's, you know, four people sharing an apartment and then there's somebody who comes in twice a week to take a look at how things are looking. Is it clean? Is it sanitary? Are they, you know, doing safe food preparation, for example? Um, sometimes it's a group of apartments in a complex and all of the people living in this kind of complex area are um, a part of the special needs population. Sometimes they have someone who actually lives in a room within their apartment. Um, but most often, and I think the best solution is for these people to live um, independently and not have their, you know, kind of living coach also living with them. But for students who are fairly impaired, they might be in a situation where they just, they and their um, living partner who's trained um, live together in the apartment and so uh, I guess I'm just sort of emphasizing that there are all kinds of creative solutions that look like group homes um, but also include a lot of independence in them. So I loved this chapter. It's a great place to stop our class because it's sort of a culmination of what happens in public school for um, young people that have special needs. And of course, the focus is to transition them to an adult life that looks like something they want to live. And as much as um, students can do choice making, right? We talked about choice making and how important that was. Um, this chapter really addresses that. So I hope you enjoyed um, thinking about this topic and uh, learning about this ending place really in public school.